Hi, Survive the Jive here, just doing a quick little video. It's a beautiful day, Gamal Uppsala. This is the site of the ancient pagan temple. It's written about by Adam of Bremen and uh, well known in other sources, such as rune stones, that this was a holy site. This is the Ting Mound. It's on this mound that people used to meet from all around, and uh, the law speaker would preside over the uh, the event that happened there. These three large mounds are called the Royal Mounds and they were burials from the migration era. And then all beyond that there are much smaller burials. Some of them date from, you know, 2000 years ago. Some of them probably from the Viking era. So this place was in constant use for over a thousand years. And uh, not only as a burial ground but as a meeting place for religious events. And also, on the other side of the medieval church there, there's uh, another flat mound upon which was a large hall. Um, this is, some say, the site of the temple, but since it was actually a feasting hall, there's also speculation that the hall was, that the, the Christians thought that the hall was a, a temple. And in fact, it was uh, more of a, a, drinking a drinking house for the local lord to uh, receive guests, while... Uh, the actual religious ceremonies were more associated with the burial mounds and the trees in the surrounding area. There are some very tall ash trees. One of them you can see poking up over the top of the mound. That's an ash tree. And uh, ash trees do grow in this area. Yew trees do not. Um, just going to make a video. Actually, I'm not here to talk about Gamla Uppsala. I'm here for, just to see Gamla Uppsala for a nice sunny day. But... Uh, people want to know why is it that science, uh, genetic science tests differ from one another. I received a message yesterday from a guy pointing to an article from 2006 by Oppenheimer that the uh, basically the DNA of Britain hasn't changed since the Ice Age and that uh, subsequent migrations of uh, Beaker people, Indo-Europeans, Celts, Anglo-Saxons, they haven't changed anything. But then the more recent study, 2018, uh, from Harvard, that one says that 90% of the DNA of the British Isles was replaced by the Beaker people uh, of the Northern Rhine area. Bear in mind, the Beaker people were not one genetic group. The Beaker people of Iberia, very different genetically to the Beaker people of Germany. Anyway, the German Beakers replaced them. So why then is it different? Why do they have different results? Isn't science supposed to be something that's falsifiable, if you can repeat it and get the same results, then it's science. So people are curious about that. And that's what Varg made a video about yesterday. But it's important to actually read these papers and look at the methodology, and then you'll understand that it's very different things are happening in these two different tests, right? DN genetic science has changed a lot. Around the 90s, people got the ability to look at haplogroups. And that was just looking at a part of the DNA. And you can look at my video on haplogroups to understand what exactly haplogroups are. But it tells you a lot about ancient DNA. It's very exciting because finally, for the first time, we could get hard science on, on you know, ancient populations of the world and understand things in that context. But it wasn't a full picture. Um, however, this was pretty much all we based most of our ancient DNA testing on until very recently. Uh, even in 2006, they were still just using the same kind of stuff as the 90s. Genome-wide testing was not financially viable for most uh, universities to do. And we didn't even have the scientific, the tools available to extract uh, high-quality genome-wide data from ancient samples until around 2010. And everything in the last eight years has been moving very, very fast, most especially in the last four years. And this kind of ability to look, I mean, you, in the, not so long ago, not just to talk about ancient DNA, but if you wanted to get a DNA test in Britain, they used to have this thing called like tribes of Britain, and you paid hundreds and hundreds of pounds, and all it gave you was your haplogroup. And it, it, it then told you whether you were a Viking or a Celt based on that, which is completely fraudulent. You can't tell you're a Viking because you have a Viking haplogroup. It's not how th things work. It's not what a haplogroup is. But uh, I, I, I've uh, said this in my haplogroup video. But then, you know, around uh, 2014, 2015,
com commercial test companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com started giving you uh, an autosomal DNA test for just like a hundred pounds, a hundred dollars. So that's because the science got better at doing things a quicker way and made it commercial viable so that the prices went down. Now, to give you a context, they also have the similar breakthroughs in ancient DNA. Not only that they can now sample and uh, sequence uh, you know, more of the genome, but uh, like they do for like commercial testing, but, um, but in ancient samples, but they can also now have better ways at extracting quality DNA from ancient samples and um, uh, reducing the risk of contamination from the, you know, the people involved in the test itself. And the greatest leaps forward in this area have been done by the Harvard lab, which is headed by David Reich, which is why all these different studies aren't, which aren't by David Reich, they just by his laboratory and different people involved. Many, many scientists from around the world are involved and they don't always happen in, ha in America. They happen in, you know, different things like there's uni the university of people from the university of Osala here are involved. People in Korea are involved. People in India are involved. People all around the world from all different ethnicities are involved in these tests on ancient British DNA, the ancient Indian DNA, the ancient steppe DNA from Russia. And they're all trying to just find out things about the ancient humans. And that, that laboratory now has made it possible to uh, extract and sequence the DNA of an ancient sample for less than two hundred dollars. That's re and that's really cheap. I mean, thinking about how much funding they need to get now, they can do so many samples as well. And of course, you know, for science, the more uh, uh, samples in the study, the more reliable the results. So, you know, that Greek study from recently about ancient Greek DNA. That wasn't so great in my opinion and others because there weren't actually that many samples. Uh, formerly there was a study on ancient e Egyptian DNA and there was, they had over a hundred samples, not all of them yielded good DNA, uh, but uh, over 90 did, I think it was something like that, more than 90 good samples. And some of them, they could only extract haplogroup DNA. Some of them they could get genome wide, that's autosomal. And then if you've got autosomal DNA, you can take the ancestry, you can say, and they didn't find a single evidence one drop of sub-Saharan DNA. So as a result of that, you could say quite clearly, ancient Egyptians weren't black. Uh, you can do away with that. Because of this Indian study, we can say, yes, there is European DNA coming in to India at the time of the uh, so-called Aryan invasions. Uh, and that means that Indo-European languages were brought in to this Indian subcontinent by a people with European ancestry, which is what people used to believe anyway, but now science has proven it. And now the same people are showing that, yes, 90%, over 90% of British DNA was replaced in the late Neolithic by Belbica related people from Germany. Now, um, there are other people who, having heard early results back in 2006 with different, more primitive, less conclusive studies, have already built up uh, an emotional investment in the results of those studies and therefore now just say, well, one study, another study, <laughs> why, why do you choose one or the other? They're not reliable. Well, that's not how science works. The biggest and most recent and most advanced study is the study that you refer to. Anything from before that can't be, you can't use outdated science to disprove the most advanced and most uh, comprehensive study. It's that simple. The only thing that will disprove the results of current studies is future studies. And we'll see what happens. But at the moment, this is a very exciting time for historians, for archaeologists, for scientists, for people who are interested in genetics. And uh, my videos, I try to explain some of these things. Um, but bear in mind, if you want to understand uh, genetics of any part of the world, try to refer to studies that have happened since 2010 more, because you're only getting a limited amount of data and information from the older studies. Okay, thanks for listening.